Um, was music always going to be a career path for you right from the beginning? Um, you know, I I sort of look back and I remember I was always going to go back to college and things kept happening <laughs> and all of a sudden 35 years went by but no it became a career yeah but initially I, I just I loved the music so much and I, I never thought I would make a living at it but I, I kept going at it and saying well next year I'll go back to college or I'll do this or I'll do that but yeah, I was lucky I got into some nice things and yeah, just kept going kept you going yeah tell us a little bit about your musical involvement before the birds before the birds, I was a bluegrass mandolin player, and I was originally, the first group I was in was uh, some fellas I knew out of school, and that was called the Scottsville Squirrel Barkers, and we made a record, uh, which didn't do much, but we worked for a while, and then I joined a, a bluegrass band called the Golden State Boys, which was quite a uh, traditional uh, band, uh, which Vern Gosden and his brother Rex were members at the time they had they had moved out to california from alabama and then we made a record and that was we changed the name to the hillman i don't know why but the producer thought that was a good idea and then i just drifted into the birds and how were you recruited there because i think you were the last one to join weren't you i was the last one that's right i i uh, i knew the man who uh, produced our our bluegrass album the hillman was working with uh, David Crosby and Roger McGuinn and Gene Clark and asked me to come down and see them because the Beatles had just sort of hit the uh, States at that time. And he said, you got to come down and hear these guys. They sing great and listen to them. And I came down and I thought they were fabulous. And uh, uh, later, uh, David was going to originally be the bass player and he didn't want to do it. So they asked me to if I wanted to do it. So I said, yeah. And that was it. I jumped at it. What was the extent of your bass playing ex experience up to that stage, though? Nothing. Nothing no, at all. No bass. I had no experience playing the bass, and then I was sort of a little nervous about that, but then I realized that none of them had ever played electric guitar, so I said, oh, we're all in the same boat. Yeah. So we all learned together. But it was quite a transition to go from playing the mandolin to playing the electric bass, I must say. I guess so, and being in a rock and roll band also from uh, from your musical origins to a rock and roll band would have been a huge step too I guess big step because yeah. it was a whole other uh, persona on stage that I didn't quite understand because in, in bluegrass you stood there and played and in in rock and roll you were supposed to be animated and I just couldn't quite figure that out for a few years so it took me quite, quite a few years to to be able to to figure that out so I was sort of standing there like Bill Wyman for the first few years <laughs> I guess that would have made it exciting, though, that all of you learning together like that. Well, I think that's why we came up with that sound. It was by trial and error. We didn't really have... We were all coming from a background of, of folk music and bluegrass music, acoustic music, and we had no uh, game plan. We had no manual that said, here's what you do. So we plugged in and sort of uh, just tried things, and we came up with this sound around Roger McGuinn's uh, guitar playing, you know, really what happened. It was a while before your compositions began uh, appearing to a large extent on Bird's albums. It was around 1967, would that be right? That's right. Yeah, were you, were you writing much before that? No, I wasn't. I, I hadn't been, been, I wasn't quite there yet. I hadn't really gotten to that place. and I, It was just, it just happened. And it really happened, I'll tell you, John, it happened after, uh, I, I don't know why this happened, but I, I did some sessions with Hugh Masekela, the South African trumpet player, oh, cornet yeah. player, and uh, he used me on bass uh, on these demo sessions uh, for this South African artist, this lady, and it was so exciting, uh, it was so different, and I came home and I started writing songs, I don't know why, it just it clicked something in my head, it sort of turned something on in my brain, and I started writing songs, and uh, I got real prolific there for a while and then we did the younger than yesterday record and i had all these tunes and that was the start of it so it was quite a i have to I have to hand that to hugh he did that but beforehand you probably what didn't quite have the confidence to, to i just didn't think about doing that i didn't even think in that area yet i was a uh, late bloomer <laughs> and uh was fairly young in the birds younger than uh, I was uh, David and, and uh, Roger were three four years older than I was and 
Gene and I were the same age. I was a bit of a late bloomer as far as songwriting. Gene, of course, was a very, very good songwriter, very prolific at that point. But I, it took me a, a year or two to get going. So the Flying Burrito Brothers, for you, was that a, a sudden thing or was it inevitable that uh, a move like that was certainly going to come about? Well, it, it was the time. It was, once again, time to move on as it was when I left the Bluegrass Band, but it was time the birds had gotten to the point where there was nobody left <clears throat> exception of Roger and after we did the Sweetheart of the Rodeo album uh, uh, Graham Parsons and I had uh, developed quite a, a, a strong bond and we, and we decided to go off and try something new and stay in that country um, uh, area country music is what we wanted to do so we, we just did that and Roger went off and kept the birds going You remember um, specifically when and where you were when you first um first met Graham and discovered his talents? Well, I'd heard about him. He had uh, the same man, fellow managed uh, Graham as managed us, and uh, I didn't meet him. I hadn't met him yet, but I, uh, the story is, and this is a true story, I met him in a bank in California, in L.A., and we started talking, and I said, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm not doing anything. I, I had this international submarine band group but uh, it's broken up and I said we're looking for another player why don't you come down and play with us and he came down and played some piano and we hired him and there it was he was with us for about six months what was that yeah now you, you mentioned before that the, the birds when they formed you didn't have a set game plan there I guess it would have been slightly different with the burritos you certainly would have had an idea there what you were after well, yeah, we did. We knew exactly what we wanted to do. We wanted to do country music and 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 most specifically duet stuff. Uh, you know, two guys singing, and we wanted to steal guitar. And we found Sneaky Pete. Uh, we put together this ragtag band of guys, and and when we got our our uh, uh, sequin suits, <laughs> and uh, very tongue in cheek. Yeah. Uh, and we knew we knew we couldn't break down Nashville because we didn't look the part. We had our we had long hair and we had you know, these funny suits and we were doing songs that were a little bit different, but we were having a good time with it and that's what we wanted to do. Once again, John, just the love of the music, you know, propelled us onward. Yeah, I'd be safe to say that commercial acceptance wasn't really a priority at that stage. It was really Well, just of course we wanted to hit record, but unfortunately we were up against some very stiff uh, strong uh, blockades in that country radio didn't want to play us and rock and roll radio didn't want to play us so we were stuck country yeah. didn't think we were country enough and rock didn't think we were a rock band you were caught in between basically we were caught there so we sort of just existed as best we could would it be fair comment to say uh, because you were caught between rock and country as you said before that um, probably in hindsight now the burritos are probably a tad underrated are, now are they underrated? Well, ma or more so at the time, I guess. Well, I don't know. I think now we, we've we received now, after the fact, we've received this respect we didn't get then, if that's what a good answer. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, certainly has become uh, more of an issue now, 25 years later, than it did then. Manassas, how yeah. your involvement in that one came about? Uh, Stephen saw us playing in Colorado, the Burritos. And this is after Graham had left the band, and I kept the band going. In fact, I turned it into quite a good live band. Um, uh, much better than when Graham and I were together. We were a little sloppy on stage. But at that, at that time, this is 1970, uh, Stephen and I were good friends from the old Buffalo Springfield days, and Stephen happened to walk in and watch us play, and he loved it. He was in starting to do a solo thing he had left Crosby Stills and Nash temporarily and was doing solo records and he asked uh, me and Byron Berline and Al Perkins the steel player to come down to Miami and record with him which we did between burrito shows and then I was feeling restless again and I was going okay and then he came up and he said would you join my band I want to start a band are you interested and I said let me think about it and I gave him an answer I said yeah I'd like to do it I gave notice to the Burritos, and I joined <clears throat> up with Stephen, and then we called it Manassas, and we made the uh, two albums, One, the first of, of which was very good. The second was a little ragged, but, you know. So at the time, it wasn't really ever intended to be a short-term project. It was 
And to be I old. don't know if it was what we... I don't know how long... What the longevity factor... I don't think we even thought about that. We were just sort of living for the moment. And uh, it was a great band. I must tell you, John, uh, w- one of the best experiences I've ever had was that... Uh, Manassas experience. They were wonderful musicians, and I learned a lot of music from Stephen. And it was the net. It was the right thing for me to do at the time. Just moving forward a few years, the McGuinn Cup Clark and Hillman project. How do you look back on that time now? I look back on that as sort of um, once again another interesting footnote. I, I actually, actually, we did do some good stuff. I think the uh, the very first record we did was good it it uh, well we caught in that disco era so it, <laughs> there's some <laughs> songs that has there's some songs on that very first record that have sort of the uh, little bit of a commercial tilt to them but gene clark wrote some fabulous songs in that uh, first record and uh, we it was it was interesting i liked it I, I a lot of it i liked a lot of it i didn't like but uh, it was always always a pleasure to work with mcguinn and Gene was quite, as always, a great songwriter, so to do his songs was very good, too. Uh, but that that wasn't meant to be. We we had our couple of records, and off we went, you know. The three of you encounter any uh, criticism or skepticism from people you know, doubting whether you could you know, rekindle past glories there? Oh, I'm sure we did. I don't recall. But I think maybe we were so adamant about not using the name The Birds that it might have been a hindrance to us. In hindsight, I look back and say, well, maybe we should have just said it was the birds and just been the birds again, but yeah. it doesn't matter at this point. What we what we did was pretty good. So. Yeah. Well, you certainly could have, and people would have accepted it, I'm sure. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. You've always given the impression to me that you're, you're most comfortable in a, in a band member situation rather than being you know, up front. Than the main well, I was, I, I was, but uh, now, of course, it's. Uh, I look at it as I'm in my almost middle fifties, and I don't think I would be in a band again. I would do short-term projects with people, but I'd have to run it. I'd be honest with you. I'd yeah. have to run the show. And ever since Desert Rose, which was very successful, I felt, and was probably the best group I'd ever put together. Um, I can't conceive of of, uh, of ever getting back into a band again. I, I just I'd rather work alone or with one or two people that I really enjoy working with. But uh, those are all past. Yes, at that particular time, from from when I started until maybe uh, McGuinn, Clark, and Hillman. Yes, it was nice being a team player. But now I am still a team player. But I like to be the captain. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to compromise it is, I've, I've put my time in now you know I've earned this right I think yeah. Yeah. yeah tell us about the Desert Rose Band how it all came together well that was the situation where I was working acoustically and I had a little quartet made of uh, originally it was Bernie Ledden and Jerry Chef and Al Perkins and then um we went out on the road and uh, worked with Dan Fogelberg, and I, I had to change a few members, so I had uh, Herb Peterson and John Jorgensen and Bill Bryson, and we did this tour with Dan Fogelberg, and after that tour was over, we came home, and John, who is a brilliant musician now, it works for Elton John, uh, kept egging me on to plug back in, because we were playing acoustically, he says, let's plug in and try some things, let's get a drummer, and so... We get hold of uh, Steve Duncan, who's a drummer. I didn't know him at the time. We get hold of J.D. Manus, who I had worked with for years, and we started playing some shows around L.A., and it clicked. It just felt great. The music was good. The singing was good. It was presented right. And I hadn't really thought of ever doing this again, but it, it worked so well. We got a record deal, and then we started getting on the radio, and it was wonderful. We had a good eight-year run. It was the longest band I've ever been in and uh, did real well, very well. When did all that finish up? We, we didn't hear about that down here. Well, we, I, I retired it in 1991. Oh, really? And I'll tell you why. We, we were having, we had this great run from 86 to 1990, 1990, early 1991, and then we started having a lot of difficulty getting on the radio, and I noticed other acts were not getting on the radio either at that point randy travis was having trouble getting on the radio and people like that and i felt well uh i was a little tired of going on the road at that point i'd been on the road for 30 years and i have children and i made the uh decision 
to stop touring, and I said, I told the guys, I said, let's retire this now with a bit of grace and dignity rather than keep it together and drive it into the ground where it becomes uncomfortable. And it was one of the few bands that I've been in where everybody left and was still very good friends, and we said, let's just stop doing this, and I don't want to go on the road anymore, and, and we're not getting on the radio, and it's a matter of time before we're starting, and we'll have to do, do uh, shows that are not up to what we used to do as far as venues. And uh, that's what we did. It was, it, I, I look back, and I never regret that decision. Um, we still work together. I'm, I'm doing sessions with uh, Steve and JD next week. As a matter of fact, um, for my own record. Oh, terrific! Yeah, so I'm, you know, I'm still doing stuff, but uh, you know, it was just the right thing to do at the time. It was the right thing to do. It's just it, it lay it down, and I'm proud of that band. I think we did some wonderful stuff. Past eleven on Rick, and in these days, in terms of playing live, you're playing mainly as solo. I'm playing mainly solo. I'll probably get more active uh, in the coming months, uh, March, April. When my solo record's done, and I'm working on it right now, and I originally had done an acoustic album this year, and I'm going back in next week, and I'm going to cut uh, half of it over electrically. Oh, yeah. I felt the tracks weren't good enough, so I want to go back in. I want to cut a lot of this over. The songs are, are real good. They're strong, but the tracks, the music wasn't jumping out as it should. It wasn't, it wasn't as good as it could be, so thank God I get to go do it over and do it right. And that's it, and it'll be out uh, April, probably. Oh, fantastic. Now, we haven't seen you down here since you were down with uh, Roger and Gene yeah, all those I years know. ago. Any I'd chance of... To... I'm sorry, go ahead. No, any chance of you following up the album with a, with a trip down under? God, I'd love to come down there and play. I love Australia. You know what Australia reminds me of? Parts of Australia remind me of California when I was growing up in the 50s. All the eucalyptus trees, it's so similar. To, Cal to what California was and I'm probably caught up to. But I'd love to. I'd go be down there in a minute. Oh, good. And I'd go surfing. I'd have a good time. Yeah. Call, get somebody to book me. I'll be down. <laughs> I'll put the word out. Yeah, yeah. What music are you listening to at home uh, for your own pleasure these days? Well, sometimes I listen to a lot of the younger uh, rock bands. My daughter uh, helps me with that she listens to a lot of the alternative rock bands um i like um i still listen to, to uh, bluegrass and and some some country old country stuff blues i listen to a lot of the old blues um gosh i don't know i whatever strikes my fancy i uh I find myself listening to classic rock radio. Isn't that terrible? I'm, just, I'm turning into an old man. I'm listening to all the, all the music from my glory days, from the 60s and 70s, which are on radio yeah. on a couple of stations. But uh, I don't listen to rap. I can't stand it. i got to be honest. I don't like it. I don't like what it is. I don't like it. I don't think it's music. It doesn't have any melody. And I'm sort of a little leery of, of a lot of the lyrics that get through these days. They're having a big uh, uh, controversy over this. I believe it's a group called Prodigy over a record that was released over here in the States. And uh, the lyrics are just out and out bad. And I go, you know, and I was explaining this to my kids. I said, good art is subtle. We never had to write a, an obscene lyric or a blatant message. We implied that. But with with the use of good words and good vocabulary, and I find that some of that stuff is pretty intolerable, you know. Yeah, I, I you know, that's it. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't like to hear lyrics. Uh, I don't like to hear a lyric degrading a woman. You know what I'm saying? Mm, I don't like yep. to hear that. And a lot of that rap stuff is just out and out junk. But that's the way it is. That's the way. Music, Chris. What what takes up your spare time? Uh, martial arts, Kempo, Karate is a Chinese form of Karate that I take, uh, study. In fact, I've, I'm just about a few days away from my black belt test. And then uh, I surf. I uh, raise my kids with my wife. I'm at the, wa at the ocean all the time, things like that. And I'm, I'm writing songs still. And I hope to try and write a book soon. Not about me, just fiction. Fiction novel, all right. 
Yeah, not about me. Boring. I've had an offer to do that. I said, it's boring. I said, I'm not done living yet. I don't want to write a bio- <laughs> autobiography because I'm not done yet. And besides, who cares? <laughs> I'm too normal. You need to have some controversy where I've been in prison or something. Yeah. <laughs> God forbid. In, in terms of your writing, your songwriting, has your method and approach to it changed much over the years? Um... I'm taking more time with it, John. I take more time, and I'll, I'll, I find myself finishing a song and going back and really looking at it. And if I find a questionable lyric or any kind of a, a line that I term as a throwaway, I do it over. And uh, that's not always a guarantee either. And I find myself being harder on myself than normal. I'll, I'll look at stuff I've written and think it's not good enough. And and if I don't write the song, then I'll find someone else's song, because there certainly are great songwriters out there, and they don't always have to be by me on an album, certainly. Sure. So uh, the idea still is to make, uh, put the best collection of songs on a CD that, so that the fellow buying it isn't going to have to hit the fast forward, you know, when a song comes up. You want to be able to hopefully aim for that goal of having... 12 or 13 or 14 songs that will appeal to everybody, every cut. And it's hard. It's a hard one to do because you can't always hit the hit a home run, you know. The new album you're working on now, is it mostly originals? Yes. It is. Mm-hmm. I'm going to cut a couple of outside tunes, I think. I just haven't quite pinpointed them yet. But uh, there's a couple of mine that I've thrown out that I listened to when we finished the record. And I didn't like them, so I'm going to re- cut something else and replace them. Okay, just to wind up, um, if you had to pin it down to any one thing, what would you see as, as the key to survival in the music business for as long as you have? Well, have a sense of business about you. Pay attention to what... Pay attention to the money you earn. Pay attention to the people you hire to handle your money. Never give your publishing away. Keep your publishing if you're a songwriter. And if you're going to go into the music business, you have to be a songwriter. You have to be a songwriter and, a, and, and publish your music. You're not going to make a living as a player unless you're such a finely schooled player that can read music and that can play sessions and on, a, on a whole other level. But as far as being a band member, if you're not a songwriter, singer. It's, it's something to do as a short-term hobby. Right. Otherwise, but mainly... If you are blessed and get that opportunity and you do and you are successful, hang on to what you make because it won't last forever. And I know hundreds of people in my business that I've known for 30 years that have nothing. And there go I, but for the grace of God. I I was lucky that I, I learned how to watch and manage what I made and to put it away and I'm not a millionaire but I'm comfortable and my family's comfortable and for God's sakes don't go near drugs what a waste of time what a waste of time Uh, but it's a wonderful thing to play music it's a wonderful gift I'm really lucky that I got to do this and I'm lucky I got to play with some of these people that I've played with I'm very fortunate Yeah, it must be really satisfying to look back and see the influence that these bands have had Ah. you've been involved with and they're wonderful and you know it's once what the greatest part of getting a little older john is that you 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 cherish the friendships you know i talk to roger mcguinn all the time i talk to david all the time crosby and i'm sorry i've lost so many people graham parsons gene clark michael clark all these people that have passed away i feel bad i miss them so much but they made a choice that wasn't exactly something i wanted to do thank god (laughs) <laughs> I'm here, you know. And we're glad you are. Listen, Thank Chris, you. thanks very much for your time this morning. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Uh, all the best with the, the new album, and we certainly hope uh, that we get, get the chance to catch you down here. To uh, I, hope, I hope so. I hope I can come and see you. That'll be great. Thanks, John. Thanks again, Chris. All Bye-bye. the best. Bye-bye.